your views on women in India and how you think that's changed. It's obviously a topic you kind of feet write about a lot in your plays, films, and now novels. Yeah. So do you want to sort of... What I think is really interesting about India, you know, I don't have to tell you all, it's a huge place with many religions, many languages, many different customs. Um, it is not homogeneous, and so there are so many different ways that women live. Um, but what I think is so interesting, and fasc what fascinates me particularly, is that um, women can be as subjugated as women can be, they can also be deeply revered and worshipped. And if we look at the history of India, we can see um, it has a really deep and rich history of um, goddesses and worship of goddesses and worship of fertility and also sexuality um, and kind of pre-colonization sexuality of women was a lot more open and um, I, from what I've read, um, seemed seem to be much more empowering. Um, and so some of you might know um, my play The Husbands was set um, in a fictional world called Shaktipur in the south of India. Um, and, and in this, in this fictional world, um, it was polyandrous, which means the women had more than one husband, and matriarchal, and matrilineal. Um, and, you know, South of India in particular has a rich history of, um, actually, of matriarchy and matrilineal, the Naya women, for instance. Um, and I think, although that doesn't exist in the same way anymore, um, and a lot has changed, obviously. A post-colonization polyandry is um, now you know, illegal and defunct. But um, what, what it kind of brought to me was the idea that there was a time that, that existed where you know, Indian women were much more um, powerful than they, than they are today. And so in the play, I wanted to explore what would happen if we went back to those times and what would that look like. Um, and it was quite controversial, and I had, you know, lots of um, people in the audience quite uncomfortable, and I also had lots of women come up to me and say, oh my god, I want to go and live in Shaktipur. Um, mm. So um, I think that's what's interesting, is, is the two different extremes that we have. Um, and so, you know, also you may also be familiar with the idea of, you know, there's the dowry system and, and also kind of the status of boy babies, and so, there are still huge amounts and problems, especially in rural communities, of infant feticide, female feticide, and, um, and infanticide, where little, small little girl babies are killed um, after they're born. It's just really, really horrific. And in some parts of Punjab, for instance, you have, um, uh, for every thousand boys, you'll have 300 girls. So it is a real problem, but Despite that, and despite those awful statistics, I think in the cities, for instance, um, much, much, much is changing. And um, I think in the, in the middle classes and the upper middle classes, the more educated families are, they're very, very liberal. And from speaking to some of my friends um, in Mumbai, for instance, you know, it, it's on the par with London in, in some circles in terms of, you know, you've got young people meeting up on uh, Tinder and internet dating and uh, people living together. But uh, one of the stories a friend said to me was she was living with her boyfriend, um, but because Mumbai's so big and her parents would never really visit her at home, um, it was fine. She never had to tell them. She just um, continued to live with her boyfriend um, and they they never found out. And then when it's time to get married, then it's fine because, you know, you just get married and every, you're very respectable. So I think, I think everything, it's all equal and all nothing. It, it's, there's so many differences at the moment. And there's a great source of change, I think, as people become more educated. But it's also interesting that you talk about, um, you know, the fact that people are more liberal in the cities like Mumbai, they can yeah. live with their boyfriends, but their families still can't know. Mm -hmm. Is, is that very much um, the way it works, that people are allowed, young people can be liberal, they can, you know, have sex, but nobody can know? Yeah, I think the ultimate goal, obviously, is marriage. Yeah. Yeah, and as long as you're kind of respectful... Sorry, even for the young people themselves? Yeah, I think so. From, yeah, because I think it's so embedded in the culture that, you know, you could live together, but in the end, there is only one main goal which is to be married and respectable. And what about the sort of more traditional customs like arranged marriage yeah. and early marriage with child brides? Do you think this is still a problem in India? Is it still happening? I think child brides is still a problem. Um, 
again in a kind of more rural communities. Um, arranged marriages, it's, it's um, you know, even here, like in, in England, you know, it's a sliding scale from, you know, someone you don't know very well to someone that your parents gave you someone's number and said, here, this girl is nice, why don't you call her up? Um, so I think it's, it depends what you classify it as a arranged marriage. And also, you also have the matrimonials now, which are now all online, so obviously you've got Shadi, but you also got Bharat matrimonial as well. So those old systems have now just move technology to something that's easier to use, but people are still using them. And obviously it's still it's very class conscious and class conscious, so there's still kind of a desire to, to keep those customs alive. And sort of talking about, um, you know, on people meeting online and things, would the norm be marriage by introduction as opposed to what we might think of as an arranged marriage where you know, the bride and the groom are set up and don't really have much time to meet. Is it now more acceptable that they would go on like a series of dates, maybe? I think so. I think it's moving that way. Mm. But again, it's, it's across the board. And um, I think definitely in the mm. cities and in the middle classes, it's definitely changing. And I think women's, women also are kind of expecting more as, gen, as the generations are going by and kind of wanting to have their own lives for longer before mm. they get married. And why don't we talk a bit about female sexuality, because that obviously forms quite um, a lot of your writing. Yeah. How, what do you think it's like for a woman in India today when it comes to her sexuality? I think it's, I think, you know, Bollywood is a massive force, and I think it uh, fetishizes love without sex. So, of course, it's a little bit different now to where, when, you know, 20 years ago, but still... I think it's a big taboo, you know, we compare it to Western cinema. Um, so I think people's perceptions of what sex is and kind of the role sex has in a relationship is quite maybe skewed. And obviously everyone is having sex, but I think how people talk about it and how open people are about it is very... Um, I think it's a lot is unsaid, I think. You were talking about um, the idea that lots of... Indian people you know have a sort of guilt when it comes to sex. Yeah. And that they've been made to feel their whole lives that it's wrong. And that when, when it gets to a point where they are allowed to do it, they can't enjoy it. Yeah, I think, um, you know, my experience, you know, and, my, and family and friends that have talked to me about it, um, it's something I've got a little bit of a bee in my bonnet about, which is the fact that, you know, we have such a rich history of sexuality and kind of... Um, openness towards it, yet conversations about it are just so well, non-existent. Um, and I'm not saying you should be able to have a dinner conversation with your parents about your sex life, but I think you know, it's a normal, natural part of life. And um, because, it's, because there's this kind of war where people just feel like they can't talk about it and pretend actually it's not happening, I think it can be quite um, unhealthy for people. And one of my cousins said to me, we were in our early 20s, and she was like, you know, I've had lots of boyfriends, da, 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 but she's like, you know, I've never had an orgasm. Now, it, it could be that the men she slept with were, you know, <laughs> no good. But I think but she, from what she said to me, it was just, yeah, I just feel really guilty. I feel like I'm, I'm repressed. And I think... Um, I think that's a real shame and I think, you know, we can do much better than that. <laughs> what about when it comes to ending relationships? Right. You know, is, is divorce more common? In yeah, India? I think definitely, definitely, definitely much more common. Um, much more kind of, it's much more accepted than it was um, before when, you know, no one really got divorced. And, you know, people remarrying after divorce or so is becoming more common. But again, it does depend on what strata of society you come from. Ramita, do you want to talk to us a little bit um, then about your thoughts on Iran and what it's like for women there? Yes. Um, do you know what? I've, I've made notes. So <laughs> forgive me for, for looking at my notes. And I tell you why I've made notes. Importantly, what's happening now in Iran is a, is, is a sexual awakening. And this is really changing women's roles in, so in society and women's relationship to marriage. Um, and this sexual awakening means that what it is is young people are sexually experimenting in a way they've never, never done before under the Islamic regime. And this is partly uh, a backlash against repression, partly 
Um, it is young people taking control of their own bodies. So after the 2009 protests, I talked to many young protesters who told me that sex for them had become an act of rebellion, that it was kind of a, a, kind of a one-fingered salute to, to, to the regime, because of course the Iranian state um, interferes uh, and tries to exercise such control over real intimate affairs of its citizens that you know, young people told me only in sex did they feel really free. They had ultimate control of what they did with their bodies um, and they were pushing boundaries. Um, and also um, growing youth culture that lives on the internet and soaks up satellite TV, Western programs and Turkish soaps. <laughs> Iranians are suckers <laughs> for Turkish soap. So, What's ha what's, why this sexual awakening, I think, is, is so profound mm -hmm. and why it is having a real change on, on women's roles in society is because it's not just confined to the elite. So this is happening among the middle classes in Tehran. Actually, I must add that when I'm talking now, I'm talking about Tehran. So Tehran is its own little world. Of course, what happens in Tehran uh, trickles out to the rest of the country, but that is, is much slower to change. So I'm talking about Tehran. Now, most of Tehran, in really simply simplistic terms, the demographic of, of Iran really changed um, post-Islamic revolution. Uh, so pre-revolution, in crude terms, you know, it was elite, and then the rest, kind of working class, or traditional conservative. But now most of Tehran is middle class. So this sexual awakening is happening among the middle classes, not just the elite. It's also happening among religious, traditional, conservative Iranians. And this is really important. Um, and how this is happening is that they're pushing boundaries within the confines of what is, you know, is acceptable and Islamic, within their Islamic boundaries. Um, so while virginity, for example, is no longer taboo among working class Iranians, it is still taboo among conservative traditional Iranians. Um, and of course, young women are finding ways around this. And I spoke to many young women from religious families um, who told me how they were still, they were having sex um, while remaining virgins. And later I'm very happy to go into specific details about all the ways that they, they, that they, they are doing this. Divorce, astronomical divorce rates are really changing the, the, the landscape. Um, I think 20% of all marriages in Iran end in divorce. In the last 10 years, the divorce rates have, have tripled. And divorce is no longer taboo. And I spoke to several young women from religious um, conservative families who were the first in their families to divorce and their parents were from a generation that whispered the word divorce, it was so taboo, supported them back then because everybody around them was getting divorced. It's, it's no longer a shame, shameful thing. Um, this is where it gets really interesting, where things have really changed in the last two years and this is how fast society is changing. Um, something called Ezdevaje Sefid, white marriage, which you touched upon, is, is couples cohabiting, mm. so living together. And the number of Iranians that are doing this has really grown in the last two years. So much so that it's talked about in newspapers, magazines, in the press. Uh, the Supreme Leader's office even issued a statement <laughs> denouncing this hideous practice. Um, and this is confined to the middle classes for all sorts of reasons. Same kind of reasons we have here. Couples don't want to commit. Um, they also, for, for many Iranians, the only way you can kind of have your independence and move out if you don't come from a rich family is to get married. And couples don't want to commit to marriage now, but still want their independence. This is a middle class phenomenon. But what's interesting is, again, religious kind of conservative women are also pushing the boundaries. So just in a different way, again within the confines of kind of the Islamic strictures. Um, and that is that there is a rise, we see this through a rise in the practice of uh, something called sireh, which is temporary marriage. For those of you who don't know, sireh uh, is temporary marriage, sexual union between a man who can be married a woman who cannot be married, of course, welcome to Iran, for anything from a few minutes, sometimes that's what it takes, right, to 99 years. Um, and there has been a rise in this for practical reasons. Um, so again, because religious families, because people from religious conservative families, there's no way that they could live together and get away with it. Um, 
so they, so they get temporarily married, and also practical reasons, couples who want to travel, go on holiday, for example, around the country, um, you can't stay in a hotel room without showing a marriage certificate, so you can show this Sire uh, certificate. Um, and the state is threatened by this. You know, the state is really worried by this um, and sees this as a real threat to the institution of marriage and so to the institution, uh, and so to, 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 to society in general. Um, and ultimately, I think this is how Iran will change. It will change through these changes in society, um, and it will happen slowly, but from within. Why do you think these changes are happening now? You have such a big you know, population of young. There's nothing the government can do about this, and this is why they're scared. You know, they cannot control so many young people who are you know, soaking up Western culture via the internet. Mm. And you were talking about uh, these apps. We, yeah, you know, uh, Grindr was in Iran, the, the gay hookup app. Mm. Um, and certainly, actually, um, the internet has really transformed the way that young Iranians date. Um, and what about traditional customs like arranged marriage and child brides? Do you, is, is that still happening? And on what scale? So, not really in Tehran. Outside of Tehran, first of all, arranged marriages is something called khastegari, which um, both parties, both sides, have to agree to the marriage. It's very, very rare to be forced. Um, so it's you know introdu introductions by family, and even if it's not by family, it's acceptable. Mm. You know, if it's a love match and you meet at work, but the families need to get together mm. and they agree on your your, your mehria, which is um, it's not a bride price; it's like a prenup uh, that the, the kind of usually in gold coins that the woman gets, and it's to protect the woman in case of divorce. The one thing we haven't touched on as well is um, women in careers and how that fits into relationships and marriage. Is it now becoming Expect normal for a woman to carry on her career once she marries in Tehran? Yeah, I mean, working as a woman is not taboo yeah. in Iran. Um, it really isn't. I guess, you know, a lot of women... So, until recently, I think the figures have changed. Until very recently, there were more women at university than men. I think just recently, those figures have shifted. Um, but what that doesn't translate into are careers for women. Are jobs. So we're seeing that we've got highly educated women, more and more women are going to university, but they're not pursuing careers and they're not given those opportunities. So it would be interesting to know what, if they do, how that will shift, but at the moment that hasn't shifted, no. Elif, now let's come to you. Um, do you want to just start by telling us a bit about how you think life has changed for women in Turkey, you know, even during your lifetime, especially when it comes to marriage and relationships? Thank you. For me, it's very interesting to listen to both yeah. of you. It's so um, enriching to, to, to listen. But also, I feel sad because both of you are talking about how, in a way, there's a positive movement forward. Mm. And I think in Turkey, we have a negative movement yeah. backward. So we're going the opposite way. Um, and that is very depressing for me and for many people in Turkey. I think we're very, very demoralized at the moment. And Turkey is, is fascinating. It's such a, such a complicated, such a multi-layered country, its entire history. Reading it um, through the eyes of women says so much. We have the Ottoman Empire, a multi-ethnic, multilingual, multi-religious empire that lasted more than 600 years. And I think we need to bear in mind that Turkey was never colonized. You know, it was in fact the opposite that left a different psyche, a different legacy. Um, and for a long time, we never had the anti-Western sentiments that you might encounter in some other parts of the Middle East that had been colonized. Throughout the Republican era, for the, for the modernists, it was incredibly important to, to achieve gender equality. This was stated as one of the major goals of the new nation state. Um, but many feminist historians have pointed out how, in a way, women were expected to defeminize themselves, desexualize themselves. So when you look at 1920s, 1930s, main narrative, it's very similar to Russian 
uh, imagery and iconography, you know, these strong women that have nothing to do with femininity and they are equally in the public space. We have gone through those stages. Uh, in terms of our laws, there were lots of positive progressive laws. Uh, Turkey is very, very contradictory, full of contradictions, because you will find lots of women who are incredibly active in many areas of life, starting with business, media, in academia, the percentage of women, both as students and also as faculty, is incredibly high. And the, and the average is in, in, uh, higher than some continental European countries. Um, in medicine, in advertisement, in the world of arts, again, you come across many women. But there's one area where women are almost non-existent, and that's politics. So at the local, regional, and national level of politics, women are almost non-existent, and those who want to find their feet have to defeminize themselves in order to look tough. In patriarchal societies such as ours, we always respect the matriarch. So for a woman to get respect, you have to be old in the eyes of the society. Once you jump to that level, you are not associated with sexuality anymore. You're not associated with womanhood anymore. You're something else, and then people respect you. So the irony is we have a very patriarchal society, but matriarchal households, in which the matriarchs do not necessarily use their newly acquired power in order to support other women who have just joined the family. Yeah. In fact, they do the opposite. We were talking you know, about young women sort of leading the way in other countries. How do you think you know, young women connected to the internet, connected to the West, how are they kind of reacting to all of this? Yeah, I wish, I mean, because we all come from societies where the, when you look at the numbers statistically, youth, the population, um, is quite big, mm -hmm. but that doesn't necessarily mean young people are progressive. It doesn't, I wish it did. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are many young people who are globally connected. Yes, there are many people who are questioning taboos, but there are also many young people, men and women, we have to accept this, who are actually doing just the opposite. I know many young women who are much more covered than their mothers. So we also need to analyze how that works, because that also is a counterculture for them. It's a reaction to the West, it's a reaction to Europe, it's a reaction to their parents' ways, whatever you see it as, but it is a reactionary thing. What, do you think things will change and you know, what needs to change on a short-term level at least? We, we have to learn to defend equality and freedoms not only for ourselves, but also for people who are different than ourselves. This is where we failed in Turkey. I remember when I used to teach at university, there would be headscarved girls, 19, 20 year old, and they would be stopped at the gates of the university. They wouldn't be admitted because they were wearing headscarves. And I would always question this because, first of all, in a very patriarchal male-dominated society in which women already find it difficult to go to university, if you stop them but allow the men with similar worldviews, you're not helping women. It's better if they come into the public space, if we read together, discuss together, if we you know, share books together, then keeping them in their house, houses. What happened was that ban, headscarf ban, was abolished in Turkey. So I would expect today's headscarf women to be more sympathetic towards today's others. Yeah. You know, towards people who are being oppressed, silenced, suppressed today. But no, they're not doing that. They're saying, no, we were the victims, we're still the victims. Nobody wants to leave their position and nobody wants to connect with the other. When you have such a fragmented society, on top of that, you have three million refugees. It is an entire chaos at the moment. Mm. The refugee issue is incredibly important because we, we have seen an increase, a tremendous increase in the number of child brides. Mm. More and more children, 13-year-old, 14-year-old Syrian girls are being married to Turkish men, not only as their first wives, as their second wives, third wives. Even though polygamy is illegal, this is happening all across the southeast Anatolian border, and feminist organizations are just shouting, yeah. this is happening in front of our eyes, but again, nobody's doing anything. Just as a sort of last point, do you think religion is playing a big part in this conserv these conservative attitudes that are coming up and some of the, more, the less progressive laws? I think we need to talk about religion. You know, we, we have to stop avoiding this. But 
the problem is we are trapped, and we shouldn't be trapped, into a duality. And these dualities, two sides of the duality, keep breeding each other. So you have people who are very biased towards Islam, and they see Islam as just one single thing, one single color, a monolithic whole, and it isn't. And then you have people who never, ever accept any kind of criticism, and that's also wrong. Because when you look at the history of Muslim countries, there have been multiple voices, starting with the mystics, you know, very different interpretations. We have to remember that plurality, because this is what extremist ideology is like. They like to reduce us to one single identity and Islam to one single interpretation. So I think we have to be careful about that. However, I think we should also be ready to talk about the misinterpretations, the big gaps, and the big gender discrimination that is present in this, uh, in this culture and also in the interpretation of this, of this religion. So we need to talk about religion.